Hey guys, thanks for checking into Brainwaves this week. Before the show gets started, please do us a solid and rate the podcast on iTunes. Let us know how we're doing. Now, on to the episode. This episode was brought to you in part by Audible. With nearly 200,000 ad-free audiobooks, I'm sure you'll find something you'd like. I recommend Brain on Fire by Susanna Cahallan. It's the story of a Washington Post reporter who describes in vivid detail her battle with anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. To hear this book and get your free 30-day trial, go to audibletrial.com slash brainwaves and sign up. The first month is free and less than 15 bucks a month for each subsequent month with no cancellation fees. So take a minute to sign up for free at audibletrial.com slash brainwaves. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Welcome back to Brainwaves. I'm Jim Siegler. Today on the show, I'm going to be talking again with Mike Rubenstein. You remember him from several episodes, including one of my favorite episodes on uh, the Tanzania Clinic, which he operates. Today, though, we're going to shift gears and talk about giving bad news badly and how to give news goodly or how to give better news or how to give how bad to give news bad better. News in a good way. How to give bad news in a good way. Exactly. So typically giving bad news badly, I think, is when you haven't planned uh, what you're going to actually say. So if you walk into a situation where you haven't thought through what you really want to convey to a patient or family, and you say something that you hadn't planned to say, or somebody takes it in the wrong context and you didn't think it through ahead of time, your whole meeting or conversation gets derailed. Hopefully you've had some time that you've spent with the patient and the family where they at least know you and trust you. Uh, certainly um, in a situation where perhaps you're in an emergency room and, and you've not met the family before and walking out kind of uh, without any prior introduction and having to give bad news to a family, I think it's very tough because you don't know your audience in that situation. So you know, in our situations, we're typically dealing with patients that were in the outpatient setting where we're having to tell patients they may have a, a diagnosis such as uh, ALS, uh, which is obviously fatal, uh, or somebody has a brain tumor uh, that they weren't expecting. Then you kind of lay some groundwork ahead of time and, and, and try to give some positive things to them. Uh, so in, 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 I think in how we've given the bad news badly is always the situation where there was no expectation by the patient or the family uh, of the news that you were going to give them ahead of time, so you didn't lay the groundwork beforehand. I think that residents, fellows, trainees, med students, they're so busy trying to learn and trying to keep up with their daily tasks that they don't sit down try to make notes, try to prepare a statement for how they're going to deliver the diagnosis of ALS to a patient, how they're going to provide some sort of emotional support to a family when they experience this incredible wave of information. And they certainly don't see their attendings or their senior residents sitting down and preparing mentally for these because maybe by the time you know someone's an attending, they may have already figured out a way to give that diagnosis because they have given that diagnosis before. Well, I think, I think thinking to the outpatient setting, you know, thinking to my own practice in the outpatient setting where I'm seeing patients in clinic, uh, I think one of the things that we have to realize today is that we're dealing with a much more informed, informed or sometimes misinformed public in that people are um, are Googling things and come in with, you know, having already Googled their symptoms and have an idea of perhaps of what they're concerned about. Uh, I think one of the places, I know that one of the practices that I have, and this is, uh, you know, a place where, you know, some people may disagree, but uh, very often nowadays, patients have an idea in their mind of what they may have. And so, you know, the place that this commonly comes up, it's probably less likely in the ALS situation, perhaps, and more likely in things like multiple sclerosis, where I have a number of patients who've come in who very clearly have 
symptoms that are concerning for multiple sclerosis, uh, and they've Googled them, and they're and and what happens is we'll take a history, we'll examine a patient, and then we'll say to the patient, okay, well, we're now going to send you off for uh, these MRI scans and send you off for these other tests, and then we'll see what those show, and then we'll talk. And, you know, that's a very dissatisfying, I mean, I can imagine if it was me, you know, the patient's thinking that they have MS and you haven't mentioned MS to them. So I always ask patients these days um, exactly what is it that they're concerned about. I think that's such a huge point is to survey your audience and try to figure out what they think and what they know before you even start to describe something because they may not even understand the words that you're using. They may not have done their research or they may have done a, t a lot of research and they may know exactly what you're talking about and have their own suspicions. And, you know, you can look up a ton of different mnemonics for, you know, how to approach a bad news situation. And nearly every mnemonic that you find is basically, you know, take a shot across the bow, ask the patient, you know, what they think, what their thoughts are, and then move from there and kind of either provide them with reassurance that, no, this is not multiple sclerosis, this is not ALS, but, you know, I am concerned about these other things. And then you can kind of either go in that direction and describe those other things, or you can take a different tack and just say, there are a lot of unanswered questions at this time. I think we need more data before we have some definitive answers. And I've seen physicians do it either way. Which way do you prefer? Do you prefer to provide a patient with a differential diagnosis that you're thinking about? Or do you say, you know, I, I don't have the answer at this point, but I think that getting these tests done, getting this imaging or this lumbar puncture is going to help us out? It really depends on what I think the patient's level of insight and understanding is. And, and, and that's perhaps a little patronizing so that I, I feel that when we talk, we, we have to kind of describe things um, in a fashion that we think a patient's going to understand. We always have to remember, you know, about informed consent and patients having being informed, and you have to inform them to the level that they can understand. I see plenty of patients who are physicians. Uh, I see plenty of patients who don't have the same understanding, and I have to make sure that, that I give the, give the story in a, in a way that they can understand. To the question of whether whether I give a differential diagnosis, I, I, I tend not to go too far, but I do want patients to know what my thought process is in a general fashion because I think that you know patients have to be invested in their care, and the only way a patient can be invested in their care is if they have some understanding as to what the process is and how we're evaluating them. And, and in doing that, I think it's been very successful sometimes it backfires. Sometimes you can give a patient your thought process and um, they may take it and run with it. But most of the time that's not the case and patients are more than happy to have you evaluate them and to process the information and then to get back to them with what you think is going on. In addition to serving how much or how little or to what degree the patient or family knows, I also find it important to provide the family with information about your specific role in the process of their, their medical care. Whether you're a pharmacist or you're a social worker or you're the physician, you say expressly, you know, listen, this is my expertise. I want to help you guys out. My role here is to describe to you the neurologic complications of your disease or, you know, whatever it is. You won't say, I want to describe the neurologic complications, but you want to say, you know, listen, I'm the resident physician. I work with a larger team. We operate together. You'll be seeing multiple physicians. Some may be giving you different opinions, but ultimately we're all working together. We're collaborating to try to deliver the best care for you. Yeah, I mean, I think that's I think that that's really important. I, I also I should say, you know, I've I've been involved in medical ethics for years as well, and have served on medical ethics committees, and that's a, a huge interest of mine. You know, there are all these ethical issues. You know, we have medical students that are very involved in patient care, and I think that often, you know, I see that a patient may assume that the medical student is actually an intern or a doctor, and that's a very significant issue. It's one thing if a patient chooses to call their medical student doctor. If they choose to do that, but fully knowing and, and having been you know, given clear information that it's a medical student, but the patient feels most comfortable for their own level of comfort in the hospital that they want to do that, that's fine. 
but you've got to be very clear with patients who what each role is because it's confusing in the hospital. There's so many people coming in and out of rooms. There's medical students, interns, residents, attendings, pharmacists, nurses, respiratory therapists, physical therapists, and everybody needs to be very clear about introducing themselves to the patient. I think we do it very well because I know as we were talking about this morning, I've been a patient several times in the hospital in the last year. Yeah, <laughs> had a rough, rough go. Yeah, and <clears throat> not at my choice. And uh, and I was blown away. I, I I will have to say, and you know, and this is kind of giving a shout out to Penn, but I was blown away. Uh, you know, the a housekeeper who would come in. Um, would introduce themselves of who they were, what their what their purpose was there, what they were doing. Asked me if I needed anything. It was like really comforting that that it wasn't you know that that everybody introduced themselves. And I mean, obviously, I was fully aware of what everybody's role was. Doctor Chandler, who is one of the neurointensive care attendings. Uh, gave a really a really good lecture on a topic that I've always thought about but had never really thought to that depth and the topic was crisis management how to communicate in crisis situations and crisis management and basically it's looking at um, looking at what the hazard ratio is and what the outrage ratio is. And I will raise my voice. I'll let everybody in here know that this man is rude. And I'll be a jerk about it, too. You want me? I'll come on. I'll go show it to you. When you help me load up. The- what is the outrage ratio? <laughs> so the outrage ratio isn't a negative thing. It's basically when you're trying to communicate to families, and this is specifically he was applying this to like situations in the neurointensive care unit or situations in medicine, but these th- this can be carried into your personal life and carried into business, into any communication where you're trying to communicate facts to somebody, key, key points, and that they need to understand. And the level of outrage isn't a negative thing. It is how much does d- does your audience appreciate or understand the gravity of the situation? I'm not following at all because I have a high outrage ratio, and <laughs> and I'm being very positive right now because it's not a negative thing. So, <laughs> so the outrage is basically when you look at it's the understanding that. So somebody's in the intensive care unit, their loved ones in the intensive care unit, they're comatose, and the family's looking at you, and they're either saying, what the hell is going on, or they're either just kind of sitting there waiting for you to kind of like figure things out. So I guess just for the mathematicians out there, (laughs) the outrage ratio is basically the ratio of the level of emotional distress to the level of communication receptivity of the family or the patient. Okay. And the idea is that is that if there's really nothing going on... If it, if what Dr. Rubenstein is trying to say here is that the patient or their family on the receiving end may be in such an emotional state that actually prohibits them from receiving and understanding information. And you can imagine this in a few ways. One, you have a patient in the ICU who's comatose from a brainstem hemorrhage, has a horrible prognosis. And the family has no idea how dire the situation is. They've just never been spoken to. The hazard ratio is the highest you can imagine here because there's no chance the patient will wake up. And if he does, you know he's not going to walk again. He's not going to swallow, to speak, or to interact with his family. Unlike this high hazard ratio, the outrage ratio would be extremely low here because the family's just not emotionally distraught enough to misunderstand whatever information you're ready to provide them. So they can receive this information quite well, although it is horrible news. Now contrast this to another ICU family who just arrived, and their father won't wake up. They're in tears, some are calling for the nurse, they're on the phone with other family members, it's just a mess. But the patient recently returned from the MRI and had to get a bit of Valium to calm his nerves. So really, he's just sedated. The MRI turns out to be normal, and neurologically the patient is quite well. He's just asleep. The hazard ratio here is really low because there's nothing wrong with the patient but the outrage ratio is through the roof. And so you have to weigh this kind of information before you attempt to engage in a conversation that has high stakes with the family. And people can only listen to about nine seconds worth of a statement, and then they don't hear anything after that nine seconds is up. And so you have to have a very concise answer. (laughs) 
you know, back in the ICU, there's a lot of stuff that goes on that's wrong, that's scary. There's a lot of machines. There's a lot of beeping. There's a lot of nurses coming in and checking the Foley and checking the pulse and looking at the screen and looking at all these waveforms. And the patients have no idea what this information is. And after you've prepared what you're thinking and you've maybe have made notes or maybe you've not and you've surveyed your audience and maybe you've talked to them before and you know how much that they can take in and you've assessed their outrage ratio based on the emotional expressions on their faces either they're blank and staring you know absent-mindedly at you and hoping for something you know positive to come out of this or they're furious and they're panting and they're red once you kind of surveyed all this you decide okay i'm going to give them the bad news or the good news. Those first few seconds of what you say are probably the most important seconds of what you have to say because of how the attention drops off pretty quickly. So what I like to think about in in the situations that I've seen other senior level physicians do is that they start off by saying, I'm concerned, or they say, I think that things are moving in a good direction, or they just give you kind of a general overview to kind of set the tone for the conversation after they've already talked to you about what you think is going on. What would you say to something like that, or how would you describe how you then approach the situation? I think that's a really good point. I think you have to, at some point, um, and whether you walk in and say, you know, we have significant concerns or you know, we think that things are going well or uh, and, and make kind of a blanket statement, you know, kind of to set the tone. I think you need to quickly assess, you know, what the family feels is going on. Like, what is their current understanding of where things are? Communications, unfortunately, there's lots of people communicating. Families are seeing things. Even though it's not intentional, they may be hearing a little something from a nurse or they may have taken it inappropriately, but you want to know what their current level of understanding is of the situation before you start on what you're doing. And you have to listen to them. If you don't listen to what they're saying and then quickly process that into what your message is going to be, then yes, then people aren't going to hear anything. You know, what are they going to hear after that? And, you know, the three most, the three most significant questions, the first questions that people have is, is, you know, are you sure of your diagnosis? How long do I have to live? And what is my quality of life going to be going forward? So they don't want to know, the research stuff. They don't want to know what studies are here and there. I mean, until you get through those three things, they're not going to hear anything. Yeah. And I I think that that's a great point too, because I've seen that some doctors say, listen, I want you to come in with your family. If this is an outpatient situation, come in with your family, uh, bring in your husband, your wife, your significant other, your parents, your kids. I want to have an open discussion about, you know, what the results are. And then you discuss the results, give them some time to think about it. And sometimes you say, I want you to think about it for a couple of days and then come back and we can talk about how we're going to move forward with this. Or we can start to make plans to move forward at that point too. One of my next questions has to do with when you're in the hospital and then less frequently as an outpatient, when you have a patient who has received misinformation or different information from another provider, if it's a physician or a nurse or a respiratory therapist or a pharmacist or whoever, and they said something that directly contradicts what you have to say, how do you tread that line of being respectful of that other medical professional but also trying to deliver the accurate information? So that's something that I, because I do attend on the wards quite often, and you know, here at Penn we have extremely complicated patients. We have often have consultants that are seeing patients, and we have a lot of family meetings. And I tell people basically straight up what I feel is my opinion, what's going on. I don't try to explain what other people have told them. I don't feel responsible. Uh, for what other people have told them. I think perhaps in the hospital that's a little more difficult if you're an attending and you've had a consultant that said something. Most of our consultants are pretty good. If we have an important family meeting that's coming up and it's going to dictate care, I typically meet with the residents and talk to them well ahead of time. We're talking about it every day on rounds and, and after rounds, the problem. And I make sure that everybody's on the same page because I don't want anybody on my team giving different information. 
if we have a situation where the where we're dealing with a problem, say we're dealing with somebody who's got a, an underlying cancer and is on our service, and, you know, they may have brain cancer or something, uh, that then we will make sure that we bring in the other consultant to actually be part of that meeting and that we've actually met beforehand to kind of make sure everybody's on the same page because that's that's probably one of the most disturbing things because I mean it's it's hard enough you know delivering bad news in a good way and trying to do it when you've got hurdles that are being thrown up in front of you um, becomes becomes very frustrating. Moving on to kind of one of the next issues about especially the ethics and uh, the kind of consequences of giving bad news and certainly one of the things that you have to always make sure you do well, not just during that face-to-face experience, but also to cover yourself legally is to document absolutely everything. And I hate that we have to talk about this on the show, but have you had any experience where the documentation of the delivery of bad news was inadequate or insufficient? Yeah, you know, I've seen it many times. I think that we need to, we we actually discussed this again in the the lecture with Dr. Chandler, you know, of where that needs to go. And there's a place in Epic for our computer system that we have where you document that. I think it was the advanced care planning and you document every family meeting. And the reason to document it is really not only from a legal perspective, but also for anybody coming in after you so that they're fully aware of what communications have been made because we have team switching, attending switching, and everybody needs to be aware of what was said previously exactly because if somebody comes in and gives different information, then that is extremely confusing, and then and then everything unravels. So yeah, I, I've seen over the years poorly documented communications with families and with patients of what patients' understanding was, and you know coming in as a physician um, and not having that information is is uh, it basically is crippling. That's a that's a great point. My last question to kind of wrap up this episode is the question of what do you do after you've given the bad news and after you've documented and when you've continued to follow up with the family? There have been a number of times when a patient may have either asked you themselves, you know, I'm interested in a second opinion. You know, what are your thoughts on that? Certain diagnoses like ALS demand, almost demand a second opinion. Uh, My practice in ALS, I'm not a neuromuscular specialist. My practice has always been to get a second opinion uh, when you're making that diagnosis. When I have patients, and not only in situations where there's um, devastating news like that, uh, where something's terminal, but in situations where um, we may not have a specific treatment, if it's an idiopathic thing, you know, often idiopathic neuropathies or other disorders that we see, if I'm perceiving that a patient has some level of discomfort in regard to um, the diagnosis, then I will ask the patient if they would like a second opinion often. And I'll say, you know, it's perfectly fine to get a second opinion if if you feel that that would make you more comfortable. It's not an insult to me. I, I love second opinions because it serves as a purpose to kind of assess how I'm doing and make sure that I've done my job correctly and that the second opinions are typically going to be in agreement with my diagnosis, but, you know, maybe they're not. Um, and so I always will say to them, please let me refer you for a second opinion if that's your choice, because I absolutely want to send you to somebody who knows more than I do in the in the area. And I want to send you to somebody who's a specialist. Yeah, and I have no qualms sending my headache patients to a more specialized headache doctor after I've tried multiple different antidepressants or migraine prophylactics or Botox injections. And I'm just not making any headway because they're really tricky to manage. And, you know, having that expert opinion not only benefits the patient, but it also does provide you with some degree of additional education to know what to do in the next case that you have a, you know, a, a challenging it's all, patient. It's all a learning experience. And so it, it, it actually, you know, it, it adds to your clinical acumen going forward that, you know, you'll get, receive back that information. So For sure. Uh, and just to wrap this up as a learning experience for everybody and, and definitely for me, things to know about giving bad news you know first of all you need to know what you're going to say and how you're going to say it so plan ahead if you're unsure of what the diagnosis is you know if you have any doubt 
definitely do your research, do your homework, and make sure you've got uh, all the facts straight. And if you don't know the answer, it's okay to say we're considering these other things before we want to do additional diagnostic testing. These are just things that we are, are considering in your case, but you know, know that that's why we need to do these additional tests. Then once you meet the patient face to face, definitely survey the audience, you know, get some insight into to what they know, what they don't know, and what they've come prepared to learn about. Because if they're not prepared to receive bad news, it's definitely not going to be an ideal circumstance for you to give the bad news. And then once you've figured out what they know, what they don't know, um, and if they're ready to receive the bad news, you've got to be eloquent. You've got to try to deliver that news within the first couple of seconds, whether it's good, whether it's bad. And then once you've given the information, you know, after the first couple of seconds, they they will zone out. They will tune out to the rest of the information. So try not to overload them with all the nuances of randomized controlled trial data or the different types of treatments and all this stuff that's either going to go right, right over their head or you're going to have to reiterate at another point in time. And always survey after you've given the information, you know, if you, you know, you should always survey that they've heard the information that you've given them correctly. Yeah. Does this make sense? Uh, because the language that you use is different from the language you use between yourself and other colleagues. You know, when, when Mike and I talk about different things, it's not like I'm talking to a, another patient. So you always have to know what their level of understanding is. And then if it's a difficult diagnosis to bear for them or if they would like a second opinion, always be sure to offer it. Be sure to document that conversation and then move on from there. You know, these things are very tough to, to discuss with patients. It's, but it's definitely manageable. It's something you can learn, something you can work on, and the more you do it, the better at it you'll get. Sounds good. I think that's all good advice. All right. Well, thank you so much again, Mike Rubenstein. I appreciate you always being on the show. It's been a great time. Thanks for having me. Mike Rubenstein, everyone. You can find more of him on some of our prior episodes, number 49, Intro to CSF Analysis, A Clinical Case in Episode 24, and, most importantly, his episode on global health and the Tanzania Clinic, number 17. Thanks for checking out our show again today. We hope you learned as much from Mike as I did. Please, please, if you found the show even remotely interesting and want other people to hear about brainwaves, take a second to put up a few stars for us on iTunes or whatever other podcast app you're using. It really helps us get the word out. The episode this week was produced by me with the help of Mike Rubenstein. Music was courtesy of the amazing Andy Cohen, Axel Tree, Little Glass Men, and Julie Maxwell on the piano. Remember, you can follow our blog at brainwaves.me, where we've also posted some great links on how others have recommended giving bad news. We've got the Twitter thing going, so follow us on Brainwaves Audio, and check us out at Facebook at facebook.com slash brainwavespodcast. That's all this week. I'm Jim Siegler. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.